G'day and welcome to the Drive Able podcast. My name's Brad Williams and next to me over there is Ali Akbarium. Today we're talking about transfers for a growing child with a disability and we're talking with his father, Paul. Um, and I can't wait to get into this interview. Uh, Daniel has a disability where he's partially mobile um, and he's a, but he's a growing boy and growing really fast and getting heavier and heavier. And Paul and Daniel went through quite a process to convince the NDIS of their needs for the modifications and ended up having it installed just recently. So we're going to unpack that story with Paul today. Welcome to the Drive Able podcast, where each episode you get to listen to two of Australia's leading professionals in the area of driving and community mobility for people with disabilities. In each episode, they interview drivers, carers, and industry experts and share the insider's guide to driving with a disability. Here are your hosts, Brad and Ollie. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to get into today's interview, but before we get started, we just wanted to do a quick shout out to our sponsors who make this show possible, Mobility Engineering and Williams OT. This show takes time and money to put together, so we just want to say thanks to the sponsors for helping us bring you this podcast. Today we have Paul joining us. G'day Paul, how are you? And can we start by getting you to introduce yourself and tell us a little about your background and also Daniel's background and your relationship and Daniel's disability. Thanks, Ali. Uh, yeah, my name's Paul. I'm um, Dan's father. So um, unfortunately, Carol can't join us today. She was going to be, but she's actually locked up in isolation with COVID at the moment. So Daniel was currently 12 years old. Um, he was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy um, several years ago now. So he um, fa basically failed to make um, milestones when he, when he was a baby. Um, had an early cesarean, emergency cesarean at 38 weeks. And then after that time, um, Carl in particular started noticing that he wasn't making the, the milestones that, that kids normally make. So that put us on a journey um, looking at the you know, special needs and not something that either of us had thought that we'd ever be involved in. Um, but yeah, basically a, a long road to get to where we are now and, and still got a long way to go. But um, we found that with the start, when he, when he first started getting diagnosed, there was, was pre-NDIS and a lot of the support that we had to get was from uh, uh, relatively charity type organisations. There was no particular good framework to a lot of things and, and particularly things like once he got diagnosed um, with muscular dystrophy, uh, disability SA, then, then didn't have anything to do with with um, him anymore after that. So quite a long journey to try to find out the best supports. Um, so with muscular dystrophy, so he's also non-verbal and has autism. So he um, walks a, a very small amount. Now, when he was younger, we did a lot of um, early intervention, uh, a lot of driving to get down to things like swimming pools. Um, there's no decent swimming pools or suitable swimming pools around the Adelaide Hills where we live. So I had to drive down to the city for those uh, and also across to, to Richmond, um, uh, Marion and out to um, you know, further afield as well to get the supports that we needed. So always a lot of driving as far as that went. So um, Dan was able to walk at his maximum probably when he was about four or five. He could walk about 100 metres with a walker. Um, and at times even you know probably 20 meters just holding your hand um as he's got bigger and heavier that's that slowed down a fair bit which was expected with the muscular dystrophy and i guess um he doesn't have any other confirmed diagnosis other than congenital muscular dystrophy so uh, apart from the fact that we know it's not one of the really uh bad ones um you know we really don't know what the prognosis is for the future. So uh, non-verbal as well. So he uses an iPad uh, app to communicate, uh, which he's, he's very proficient at. Um, got him in mainstream school. Um, very happy with the school that he's going to. He's just started um, high school this year. The support that he gets from them is extremely good. Um, so that's basically the wrap up of, of you know, where he is. And, and um, so yeah, a lot of the time now he's in a wheelchair, um, probably his normal mode of, of transport by himself, uh, still in still in manual wheelchair, possibility of going to electric or some form of electric assist in the future. 
Yeah, right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Paul. It's it sounds like you've been on on a, a massive journey over his uh, twelve years um, in regards to working pre NDIS to now working with NDIS. What what are some of the main changes that you've noticed? since NDIS came on board. We we talk about NDIS a lot in this podcast and the pre and post NDIS uh, days. Um, what what major differences have you noticed? So I think that the, um, the major thing is that when it started off, it was, was really with, um, particularly with Novita, but also with CAFs and a few other services that we used. And a lot of that was was charity driven and you know once we start talking about the the major costs of things like car mods that really had to get funded either you know through somebody assisting us with something like that or otherwise by ourselves so NDIS is definitely a positive um, but the bureaucracy associated with it is um, excessive in my opinion so you know we, we struggled a lot with a lot of these changes but having having the one framework is definitely a good thing. You know, we can now go and um, get occupational therapists, speech therapists that he uses, physios that he uses. We can use whichever one is, you know, is, is best for we would like and some, um, some ability for, for some of the, the core supports we, we self-managed as well. So we can do some of that a little bit more flexibly than what we could beforehand. Yeah, right. Let's let's talk about uh, some of that bureaucracy. Um, and as we as we know, this is a, a driving podcast mm. where we want to talk about uh, how you get out and about in the community mm. with with Dan. Um, so let's talk about through let's talk about some of the hurdles you've had to jump over and some of the hoops you've had to jump through mm. to get where you are now. Previous, previously, before NDIS, how was how were you and and Dan and a family uh, getting out and about? Yep. So uh, first up, when uh, just before Dan was born, we got a uh, at that time a new Ford Territory, uh, which was you know, quite a quite a good capable vehicle, um, suitable for you know we we do a lot of country driving, we do a lot of um, uh, towing. Of vehicles uh, of, um, with the vehicle as well. So whether it's just taking things to the dump or um, I'm also into motorbike riding, so putting your trail bike on the back. Uh, Carol's got a little sailing dinghy, all, all those sorts of things that we really you know, use the vehicle for. Is it just um, the three of you? Sorry to interrupt. So what was that? Is it just the three of you in the family? No, Sh Charlotte, uh, Dan's younger sister, is just turned 11. Okay, cool. So yeah, so um, yeah, Dan's sibling. Sorry, I should have mentioned that before. Yeah. So um, so at that stage, we had the territory. It was working quite well uh, for several years. Um, Dan stayed in a booster seat a lot longer than what uh, he would have normally, because otherwise, um, on any trip, but particularly on longer trips, he just doesn't have the strength to hold himself up and hold himself straight in the chair without the extra support. So by the time he was nine, probably about three years ago, uh, we started looking into what you know, what was going to be next. And he was starting to get fairly big and heavy. He was probably 25 kilos at that stage. And we, you know, we were helping him in and out of the car with a, you know, either with a little, uh, like the baby's toilet seat step that they use, put one of those next to the car so he could help get himself in and out um, or just lifting the lot. And I guess that, you know, we got to that point where we needed to start thinking of something else. Um, so, so you were involved in a lot of the manual handling directly, like like yes, definitely. Him yep. up and, yep. yeah. So Carol and myself were both doing a lot of, of manual handling of him, lifting him up. Um, yeah, quite uh, no, not very ergonomic when you're trying to lift a 25 uh, kilo kid. Um, yeah. You can have tantrums uh, if you've ever seen an autism tantrum. Yeah, uh, yeah. Quite specky. Um, yeah, if he's doing that and you're trying to lift him into the back of a territory and into a, into a baby seat where you've got, you know, the big arms on the side and stuff, that's um, a bit of a challenge at times. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess there's, there's is there risks of, I mean, aside from his discomfort, you, both of you potentially have risks of potential injuries or getting hurt in that process as well, like, or putting oh, back outs and knocking into yeah. things. Yeah, so yeah, Carol, Carol's got... Um, whether it's diagnosed or not, but definitely got ongoing back issues now, um, you know, contributed to by that amount of lifting, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, right. So so he got to the 25 kilo stage. It's really difficult to get him in and out of the car. And you've highlighted that, you know, with the autism, if there's a if there's a an outburst, a, a behavioral outburst, and that can make it really difficult to get in and out. But he had some mobility as mm. well. How did the NDIS take that when you were trying to well, what was the next step? You wanted to upgrade to something that helped you with your back. Yeah. So what did you do? What process did you go through and and how did you convince the NDIS that this was worthwhile? <laughs> Not easily. Um, okay. So so we went through a process. I think basically um, the Kia Carnival is the is the special needs vehicle of choice. Um, so we went through that. We we uh, had ordered a, a new one of those. Got the mid level one, so it had the electric doors. Can I just um, just yep. just pull up one second, one step before that? Yep. Um, because we haven't actually talked about how you got to a product. Um, yep. So how, how did you get to the point of um, needing a product? And then and then product went for the car, right? Yeah, so so I guess we looked and at... And what was that product? Yeah, so we, we, we looked at ramps probably a little bit. And, um, you know, as, as I think most people do, you get your, your Kia Carnival, you put the... Um, you get it completely modified, you put a ramp up the back, the main thing that we didn't like about that was that that takes away a lot of ability for, for a lot of things. And I was still keener on having a, a turning seat or, or a seat that we could put him in properly and support him with. And we, we talked to, um, did a bit of research and then found that there was a, a company that was doing a, a base that would turn. And, and um, so we're talking to the occupational therapists um, uh, previously and then that sort of suggested something like this so a bit of a look and then thought that we needed the extra support because this was just like a normal uh, kid seat uh, and so then I came up with the idea of maybe trying to get something like a um, yeah a, a racing seat type thing with bracing and harnesses and stuff um, as we went through that process then uh we got in touch with the with the OT that we currently use, and and I think the words that he used was something like that. That's what I would have done a few years ago. Come and have a look at this. Uh, and at that point, I happened to be in there and took me down. Had Dan with me actually. Took me down, showed me the Turney Evo seat, and I thought that's exactly what we're after. It keeps the back free. It lets him go in and out. We can transfer him easily into a wheelchair. Um, Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have that that base option, but that yeah, you know, that's something that we definitely want to look at for the future. That's the um, wheelchair base of the tourney. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The transfer. Yeah. Um, so what whether we look are you using on top of the tourney? Because there's a few different ones. Like there's one which I know is for children. Is that the one that you're looking at, the BUVC? So he's got, I believe, it's the adult one uh, oh, with yeah. some extra bolsters and also a front um, straps that come down as well. So. So that's supporting. the Bev seat for anyone that's listening. That's the Bev seat that Paul's referring to. It's the adult size uh, seat, and uh, it sounds like Dan's still growing. Um, that that seat's got some adjustability to it. It's got, and I think Paul, you're suggesting that it's you've got padding on the side to make it a bit more like a child seat to support his yep. his torso. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so underneath the the backrest padding and the and the base padding there's been a couple of um uh Wushu motor trim has made up a couple of side bolsters as well so the aluminium bag sits quite flush in and then really nice padded sides so that'd be probably 120 millimeters high um mm -hmm. on the sides and the, and the bottom so really holds him in quite firmly support you know if we're doing uh, a, a few hour trip he's, he's a lot more comfortable than what he was previously so just to unpack this a little bit for anyone that's listening and thinking, oh, geez, this sounds like a good idea, uh, a quick Google search. You can look for a Turney Evo um, and, and go and have a look at maybe the Braun Ability website and have a look at the Bev seat. And all of those uh, accessories are there to go and go and have a look at uh, and you'll be able to get a picture of what Paul's actually referring to. So the seat comes... Where, where's Dan situated in the car? Is he in the front of the car or in the middle of the car? Where's he situated? So, so he is um, he's second row with um, on the on the passenger side. So he so he, yeah, if we're parking parallel parking to a street, then he his seat turns out towards the footpath. 
Excellent. So having having spoken to people with the NDIS and also mentioning that you said um, there's a bit of bureaucracy, hmm. the first thing that popped to my mind um, is that, uh, like you said, your child is able to kind of step into the car hmm. with a bit of assistance. Yeah. And this is taking that whole thing away. Um, so I'm guessing NDIS might have put up a few barriers or hurdles because it's kind of like... To me, even as I'm thinking it out, maybe it's not 100% clear to them. Um, and I'm guessing you probably had some grief around that. <laughs> so um, we got the car brand new in April 2020. The car seat was installed in, I think it was February 2022. Yeah. Well, and that you. whole time we were pushing to get this done. Um and was it around when, the context of what I was saying around kind yeah, of that? It was around thing? it was around the fact that that they wanted us to have a ramp. When the when we first got asked about um, the vehicle, you've got to have it for eight years. We want to see the odometer on it. The first photo that I took had nine hundred kilometers on it. Yeah. It had forty six thousand on it by the time it was installed. Wow! So yeah. that that's the level of frustration that we had. Um, so and you're NDIS, saying they wanted you to have a ramp, Paul. They wanted the so, NDIS kept on pushing for you to have they, a ramp. Now, kept, yep. why was that, and why why is that different to the goals that you had as a family? I have no idea why they wanted that, except that, as far as I can tell, they seem to have a checklist, and they get to that point and they tick a box that says get a ramp. The issues that we've got with that one is my understanding that the ramp couldn't be fitted in South Australia. So it would have had to get trucked over, sea, over, over um, to Eastern State somewhere. Would have had to get um, you know, all the modifications carried out there. So probably an extra couple of weeks over what, you know, being without it already. Um, the issues with the ramp itself were, were a couple of things. One, as I said already, you know, we like going off and doing things and, you know, um, to, to take so so as an example, we've got a we got bicycles. We go across to to the parents in law shack over at Port Vincent, about three hours or so from Adelaide. We want to take the bikes over there. I've got a little sidecar bicycle set up for Dan as well, and we go looking around the streets of Port Vincent. So that's all on a trail. Now, two issues with the ramp. One is that you can't put a trailer a tow hitch on with the ramp, so it rules out altogether. But even let's say that we don't take the bikes over to Port Vincent. We want to take him to Port Vincent um, with this ramp. It would put him right in the middle at the front, directly behind the the, um, the front row. And he would, and Charlotte would have had to sort of squeeze in on the side. So we drive along, we get to Port Wakefield and it's time for a toilet break. That means that we need to unload everything out of the back of the car, mm -hmm. pull him out of the, in the wheelchair put everything back in because I'm not going to leave it all on the side of the road in Port Wakefield, go off for a wee break, go to the service station, unload everything again, put him back in again, put it all back in again. And there really is that, I mean, the ramps are, are definitely useful if you're at that point or if you've got that sort of, if, if that's the best solution for you. But I looked at one, which was really nicely done, but I think it was only about 20 centimetres on either side of the ramp where you could put shopping or whatever you wanted without having to, Move everything. Um, so a couple of other issues with it. What, um, one being that you've, you've well and truly modified the vehicle. So your resale value is either shot or you're looking for a special needs customer to buy it off your second hand. Um, whereas with the Turney Evo, we can take that out, put it back in again. Um, yeah, and we've still got all the standard stuff all nicely wrapped up in plastic and, and tucked away in the corner of the shed for, you know, if and when we want to sell it and move, you know, whatever, whichever way we want to go with it. The other issue that NDIS didn't seem to understand at all was about the restraint of the vehicle. So he's got a, a manual wheelchair. It's got proper tie down points, everything else. So the wheelchair gets tied in, locked down securely. NDIS is saying that's really good because the wheelchair is secure. My point is that my son is held into that wheelchair by one lap seat belt with a couple of M6 bolts holding those six millimeter bolts holding that wheelchair in holding him into the wheelchair. I personally don't care how well secured the wheelchair is. And they didn't seem to understand that the securing of the person is more important than the wheelchair. So yeah. um, then we also got asked uh, three, to, we, we got asked um, three times to make sure that we're gonna keep it for eight years. So we'll get on with this and then we can. <laughs> um, 
and also um, having to get different quotes. So we, we had to get three different quotes. We already had one other one. We had the one from, uh, from Wilshire Motor Trimmers already. Uh, somebody from Mission Australia who we worked through to get the NDIS funding, went and found another company somewhere. Um, they were gonna submit that quote, which was for less. And then when we asked for a copy of it and put them side by side, it wasn't like for like. Yeah. So just constantly making life hard to try to get the product that we're after. Yeah, look, just just to uh, go back on one point for our listeners, if they're they're a bit confused and and listen to some of our podcasts before, uh, Paul, I, I, I don't want to undermine you and mm. and and what you've been through as well, but the seatbelt on the wheelchair is not a seatbelt for the car. Mm. Another seatbelt would have had to have been right. installed, and it would have had to have been installed into a right spot, so it actually went over his shoulder and, and across his lap and that would have been in addition to a seatbelt on the wheelchair just for our listeners that's that's an important factor to understand and it would have been that another uh, seatbelt tower would have had yeah, to have been exactly. installed into your carpool would have been yeah, another like, modification to that car but yeah. like i've mentioned from the engineering nerdy point of view that is nowhere near anywhere um the same level of safety and standard that the standard seat offer operates mm. in. and the yeah. And, and the seat belts that were built into the car by robots with high accuracy as compared to some guy in a workshop, you know. Um, so that, that's the bottom line. If you've got the option to have the high multi-million dollar engineering um, of the vehicle factory kept for yourself, that's what you've got to do, not go cutting up all the safety systems of the car, you know. And it's been crash tested as well, hasn't it, Ali? You know, the car went through yeah, a whole lot of ANCAP ratings or whatever uh, ratings it was in Europe or wherever the car came from as well. It's been through all its crash testing at a very high standard where we're relying on not, not undermining the quality of work that a lot of um, workshops are doing around Australia, but this is the yeah. last resort. We're relying on somebody retrofitting something with safety compared to the high initial standards at the start. Yes, and it needs to be for purpose. And what I'm hearing from the very beginning is your child doesn't need to be in a wheelchair all the time. So why the hell are they being traveled around in a wheelchair? You know what I mean? Like that, that seems to me pretty ridiculous that that's even an option because that's not even how they travel around, you know? So why are they forcing them to get into a wheelchair to travel around? That's sort of, yeah, it's, it seems like you're going backwards, um, yep. almost, you know? Um, yep. that, that in a way is, is pretty shocking, you know? Uh, and that was one of the things and that was, um, yeah, as Carol said, that there's no, um, it's, it's one or the other this midpoint of, of he can do some things, he can be semi-self-sufficient, but still needs a wheelchair a lot of the time that just didn't exist, doesn't exist. So as soon as you say wheelchair, they go ramp, tick that box, here's what you need. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's so many there's so many factors in there of how it impacted on your life over the mm. two years. Um, I mean, COVID wouldn't have had a wouldn't have made it any easier through that period as well. I mean, it mm. sounds like you were right smack bang in the middle of the the mayhem, and and your poor wife's got uh, COVID now and and yep. locked in the bedroom and can't join us today. So mm. it's still happening. Mm. I'm sure that that probably made it a little bit more difficult as well. I think that. That just adds, yeah, I think it's added stress to everybody's lives. But, yeah, there was definitely points there where you're trying to manage all of that, you know. And as he got bigger, you know, I think I said he was 25 kilos when we are in the, uh, you know, when we swapped over from the from the territory to the key, or he's, you know, he's 35 probably by the time we finally got that seat into the into the Kia. Um, yeah, and it is a lot better. Yeah, even then lifting him was a bit better, but... Yeah, you look at Australian manual handling guidelines, and they don't say that you're meant to be lifting 35 kilograms. No, no. yeah, it's um, and it's, and that's a sack of potatoes or a square box. Yeah, We're talking yeah. about a um, somebody with a personality yeah. um, and behavioural yeah. issues. If we're talking yeah. about the autism and so yeah. forth. You've got fatigue at the end of the day. Mm. You've got all kinds of other factors that need to be considered. That's 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 not the same as lifting a box of exactly. 25 to 35 kilos. Yeah. So would you say the, um, well, I guess, uh, uh, looking for a couple of tips for other parents, um, mm. persistence, I guess, it sounds like what, what it was, just keep fighting for what you believe. I think a lot of persistence and get, you know, get the right OT, get get that OT that you can trust to come up, you know, particularly somebody that's got that knowledge of, 
yeah, you know, vehicles and yeah, you know, not not just driving. You know, I know that's probably one of the key things that people think about with vehicles, but also you know somebody who knows about how to deal with you know with passengers because um, you, you've got to get that right support because otherwise you spend enough time banging your head against the wall and look for those things for those sorts of options. You know, talk to that to that person when when I. You know, when Dan and I went in and had a look at that seat first up and we put him in there and it started turning, it's just like, you know, this is what we need. This, yeah. this is the solution. Unfortunately, yeah. it still took a lot of a lot of fighting to, to get it. Yeah, One thing- look, I've, I've worked through a lot of this in the past as well. And, and it's it's about convincing somebody who can't see the solution. Yes. That it's the right solution. And um, it does take the OT... Uh, it, there is a skill in writing reports mm. to, to, and trying to unpack a story. Um, so they actually go, oh yeah, this makes, this makes sense. Um, but uh, on, on this, uh, on this occasion or, and on other occasions for me as well, um, there's been times where you have to, as an OT, sometimes answer very basic questions that you mm. would think would be a given um, like, like manual handling of lifting somebody in and out of a car. Uh, yeah, they need to really unpack that to a to a great level. So uh, I, I'm glad that you mentioned about making sure that you get a, an OT that is has worked in this area before and it has knowledge about it. And we've that's come up multiple times in this uh, podcast. It's it's also the modifiers as well, isn't it? To to yes. really get an idea and a trust of. Mm of that the qual- the quality of the product and the mm. installation of the product is going to do the job. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that was one of the things when yeah, you know, when I um when I looked around Wilshire Motor Trimmers and they gave me a little bit of a look at some of the modifications they were doing and um yeah, how how good those installations looked, it was pretty easy to say that we're going to be comfortable with with them carrying out that work. Yeah. When when the uh, NDIS are asking you to get two, three quotes and you, you, did you go and visit those people? Did you go and do assessments with those people, get a feel for their workshops and things like that? Or was it just get a quote and, and move um, on? No, so so I didn't actually end up going. There, there was one other um, local company. We got a quote off of them. Um, you know, I think that was one of the, one of the first things was... Um, I think somebody from NDIS said, oh, you have to go and show him the car. And I rang him up and I said, I'm pretty sure he's seen a Kia Carnival before. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. there wasn't much point going out there with it. Um, their quote came in, I think, fairly similar to to, um, to Wilshire's. Uh, and then, like I said, there was a third one that somebody from Mission Australia, can't remember the exact details of what happened there, but they wanted a third quote at that stage. There wasn't a third company in SA and they managed to, I think they managed to find one or they found a quote from interstate again. And once again, you know, as I said previously, that was was not for the same, mm. um, not for the same modifications as what we were looking at there. Yeah. I, the, the other um, difficult bit as well was with the lifting hoist uh, that's installed in the vehicle. We also went back and forth quite a few times on what rating that hoist should be in case it does need to go to electric wheelchair. So. That's we haven't we haven't even mentioned that. That's a lifter for lifting wheelchairs in and out of yep. the boot space. Is that yep. right? Yep. So we got the one that's forty kilos that was installed at the same time. Uh, really nice little unit, packs away. Or um, you know, if we really want to load the car up, I can I can pull it out and start start it somewhere else. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it, um, we take the handles off the, the hand rests off the wheelchair, put a couple of slings onto it, and it just lifts straight up and slides into the back of the car. So it gets rid of that manual handling for that mm-hmm. as well. Yep. Sounds good. One one thing I think um, we'll probably start kind of wrapping it up, but one thing I wanted to recognize, but also point out and maybe even see if you've got any commentary around it was um, trusting yourself as a parent um, because this is a common story and I recognize that as a fellow parent and I guess give you kudos is that you're getting feedback from others that no, this is not what your child needs. Mm-hmm. And this is a common story we hear, but I guess I want to put it out there that nobody knows themselves and their family, like the parents. So you, if you've got someone, and I guess also I wanted to see if you've got any tips on the emotional side of things. Cause again, being a parent, mm-hmm. if you're sitting there and some bureaucrat is telling, you no, your child needs this, 
it would probably set a fire up your butt, you know, like I, it would probably be pretty hard to emotionally deal with that. And, and I guess how are you trying, how, how are you managing that? Um, and, and it would be great for other parents to, to hear that because as I said, people trust themselves and then they get, they, 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 they kind of question that trust, you know, cause they're like, Oh, this guy's saying I need this. And then you, now you're going, maybe I don't, but, but I guess what I hear often is people that do trust themselves and fight for the, what they know is best for their kids. Um, it's always got the best outcomes. So um so yeah, how, how do you feel about that? I think part of that is, you know, is that understanding. Like I said, you know, we go off and do lots of things, you know, longer trips and everything else. And so I was convinced right from the start that this is what we needed. Um, one of the things I think that um, NDIS takes into account is the needs of of that NDIS participant, not a, you know, not of the overall family. So. I can understand that from one point of view, but at the same time, you know, my argument for that is, well, Dan wants to go out and get involved in the community. That's that's one of his goals on his NDIS plans. Um, in order to do that, we have a bicycle and we've got and we've got a, a, a sidecar bicycle as well that we go out and we get involved in community and get him out. That's that's one of his goals. This is helping us to achieve that. If we didn't have that, then we couldn't do it. Um, Carol and I work really well together. Carol, you know, did the did the brunt of all of this, but you know, we talked about a lot about what we need and how, you know, how we're going to get it you know, with the support from the OT and our, and our other coordinators. But I think you just have to trust, uh, as you said, you know, it is, it is at times hard to restrain yourself. Sometimes when you keep getting, you know, you get asked the same questions and, you know, and personally it's immensely frustrating that we wanted to get this done two years ago and by the time we finally got it done the car had 45,000 kilometers on it yeah and we still expected to keep it for that much longer which is which is fine I intend to keep the car for a long time but it um it should have been just a lot more quickly than than what it was so yeah I think in answer to that um yeah all up the you know the positive for, for Carol and myself is that we, we're pretty strong together and we you know we had good understanding of what we wanted and what was going to be best for our family and how we we're going to do it yeah. And have all those needs been met now? Is, has the car ants with the turnout seat, has it has it met all of your needs as a family? Definitely. Yeah, it's it's exceptionally good. You know, we've done uh, a couple of trips away to caravan parks. We can put, um, you know, went for, for a holiday only three or four weeks ago. We had bicycles on the back um, and we loaded up the back of the, of the car and we went off to a caravan park and, um, kids rode around on bicycles. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, with Dan and myself in the in the sidecar one. Charlotte rode around on hers, around the around the caravan park for for a few days. Without this, they wouldn't have been able to do that. You know, that opens up that interaction with other kids, which is all part of being in the community, getting them out and involved. That's the important things, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. families do. It's not just a matter of getting to and from school or mm -hmm. or the day to day. It's those bigger pictures as well, and that's and that's what. Uh, cars are there for and and i guess that helps us wind up and leads us to our final question for mm -hmm. for all the people that listen to our podcast and and all the people that get interviewed we've got one final question that we ask everyone but just before we ask you that final question we quickly want to acknowledge our sponsors one more time that make this show possible mobility engineering and and williams okay uh, williams ot i should know that one um okay so as we've learned over the podcast cars are more than just getting from from a to b and, and you've highlighted some of those things already what's something that's really meaningful for you as a family or for Dan uh, that you've used your car for? You've mentioned the, the caravan trip away but um, or the, the camping trip away, but what's something that's really special for you as a family that you've used your car for more than just getting from A to B? Um, I guess one of the things that, that hasn't come across as yet is that, um, you know, Dan is, you know, he's, he's our lovely son as well as, as the issues that he's got. Uh, and mm. he does have a fantastic sense of humour. Yeah. Um, one of his favourite things is, is you know, he does like speed. And I guess this is one of the things that, um, you know, any other young kid would be out there, any other young boy would be you know, riding bicycles, riding motorbikes, skating, surfing, whatever it might be. So he doesn't get to do all of that by himself. So I assist him with some of those things where I can. But yeah, one of his favorite things is to go for a drive. And these days when we go for a drive, we um, we look for cows in particular. Um, and then we laugh when we can't see cows. So we'll sit in the back giggling away because we can't see cows. 
<laughs> sheep cows, then we start looking for sheep. We see sheep, then we look for bin chickens. So um, <laughs> we drive around and have a giggle while we're, while we're filling in some time if Carol's off an appointment or something else, or just on the way to school. Sounds great. Awesome. Hey, um, Paul, I've, I've seen this photo as well, um, and that's how we you know know each other as well. Mm. But that need for speed, it, the sidecar on a on a motorbike mm-hmm. is that right? You, you you get him out and about and yeah. and take him for you know adventures on a on a sidecar on a motorbike is that right? Yeah, so that was one of um, well one of my main passions is is motorbike riding and mm-hmm. yeah, always have had um, at least one motorbike. So um, given that given that I like doing that, we looked around uh for something suitable for him so charlotte's just got a little a little one as well that she rides around on um and i found a for, for those people that know about him a sidecar motocross bike just a little 100 cc one and uh modified that so put a put a seat on onto that one and he sits there and um go you know, riding around on that and he sits there and giggles and laughs at everyone and waves and has a great time and uh, to get that places, I'm assuming you need that uh, tow bar to, yeah, to get the exactly. sidecars around exactly. and the motorbike around. Yeah, we have the tow bar. I take it off. He sits in there um, a couple of times. He has refused to get out of the seat in the sidecar while we stop for lunch. He would just sit there and I've got a nice photo of him with his um, visor up on his helmet, needing a sandwich for lunch. Yep. Uh, another photo when we did manage to get him out and put him under the gazebo to have a sausage for lunch. And then I turned around, he's back over at the bike trying to work out how to put his helmet back on. <laughs> so, yeah, no, he definitely enjoys that. Like I said, it's the sort of thing that, yeah, other other 12-year-olds would be doing by themselves now, whether it's on a bicycle or surfing or skating or whatever that is. Mm. Um, so for me, I think it's one of those things that you, as a parent, you've got to try to help him, for, you know, get that experience that he would be getting otherwise. Yeah. Uh, mate, it's uh, come up so many times that uh, through this podcast about parents and and what they do for their kids. Um, it sounds like Dan's a Dan's a very lucky boy to have yourself and and Carol as parents, and we thank you a great deal for coming on and doing this podcast with us. Uh, we're very thankful. Um, if our listeners have any further questions, uh, is that able, are they able to get in contact with yourself at all? Or is there a way that they can answer questions? Um, you have their answer questions answered, I should say. Yeah, we'd be more than happy if people want, uh, want to have a talk. Um, yeah. Carol's a very good advocate. So, yep. um, or if they want to talk with me about anything else, then yeah, get in touch through the, through the podcast, however that would happen, be more than happy to talk to people. Yeah. So anyone that's listening, just, um, yeah, ask your question and, and we'll put you in contact with Paul and Carol and, and they might be able to help you out if you're struggling with the NDIS maybe and, and you want their opinion on on how they might answer a question or, or something like that. Put your comments down below uh, wherever you're listening to this and uh, we'll put you in contact uh, with, with Paul or, or Carol and, and they might be able to help you out. Yeah, I think hey. that'd be great. And, and one, one last thing I'll mention actually on that, which is related to this is, a little side rant is um, family is part of community. So, um, you know, like like when they say community in the individual, it doesn't make sense. A person comes with a family, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. so if you're not including the family in that whole picture, then you just got it wrong in the first place. Yeah, you know? so, yeah. so it's, uh, it's the whole thing. It's the whole package. So yeah, yeah. we keep our fingers crossed that some NDIS delegates will uh, listen to this podcast because these stories make a make a massive difference. And and even if it's the OTs or modifiers that are listening to to this podcast, uh, g'day, hi from Ali and Brad and, and Paul. Uh, but yeah, we share these stories for that reason, so people can learn, so people can understand, and so hopefully it gets easier for for people moving forward. Yeah, thanks, Paul. That was great. Yeah, really appreciate your time and uh, energy today and, and coming on board and, and our, our best wishes for Carol and hope she's uh, out of isolation real soon and, and feeling better. Uh, for all of our listeners, stick around after the break because, as always, Ellie and I will do our top three takeaways from, from this interview. Paul, thanks very much for joining thanks, us. Paul. See ya. Cool. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, Ellie. 
All right, welcome back. In this section, we bring you our expert analysis and top three takeaways from the interview. This is where we provide our more than 30 years of joint experience in the industry, helping people with disabilities to drive and get out in the community in a safe and meaningful way. So Brad, the lessons, number one, what did we, uh, what did we discuss? Well, we wanted to draw your attention to the manual handling side of things. The manual handling thing is something that I think gets overlooked higher up the higher up the tree in the in the uh, NDIS approval area, uh, and it's something that we want to make mention that it's 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 something that gradually builds on you. It's not like trying to lift a twenty five kilo box. We made mention of that in the podcast, but it's more that the child gradually gets heavier and heavier, maybe five, ten, fifteen, twenty grams at a time. So it mightn't be as noticeable as trying to lift something for the first time. Uh, you, you're gradually getting stronger as a parent and building muscles, but there's going to be some point where the, it's the final straw that breaks the camel's back. And in this case, it's going to be the parent's back. And, and we want to draw your attention to making sure that you're, you're taking attention to those little niggles in your back and the early stages because um, they're not a box. Paul highlighted that it's it's somebody with a personality, and uh, if the person's got autism or behavioural issues as well, well, then that's going to make it an even more uncomfortable uh, object. Kids aren't objects, don't get me wrong, but uh, if we're comparing it to a box, it's a much different, much different lifting capacity that you actually have to do. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty out there. And the, the one thing which I thought of when I was thinking about this was. Um, Something common in the corporate world is called work creep, right? Um, and this has a very similar kind of thing. And I've actually suffered from that in as a business owner as well, where like work creep, where you just pile bits of pieces, extra bits of work on, and you don't realize and you kind of adapt, you know, and it's the same thing. The person gets a little bit heavier and you go, oh, well, they can kind of move around and I can adapt and I'm adapting and you don't even realize. And then all of a sudden, which is what happened to me a couple of years ago, you just hit a wall and have panic attacks and fall apart and go, what's going on? And then you realize that you're doing about 10 times more work than you what you were. And that's the same here. You know, you, you'll be uh, like, like in the situation here with Daniel, could be eight years old. And before you realize it, like we all know with our kids, like where did the time go? Two years has passed. He's three, four kilos heavier and you're still doing the same thing and you haven't even made any adjustments, no assistance. Um, and again, could be all right, and suddenly, bang, something will go, and then, and then you, then you're kind of stuffed because then nobody can get around anywhere. And we want to, I guess, highlight the the dangers around that, and bringing in these devices sooner than later is is really good. Yeah, and and everyone who has kids knows that growth is unpredictable. Yeah, and it could be that one year they're 25 kilos, and the next year they're 35 kilos, mm -hmm. and that 10 kilo growth. It could, it could happen in as short as a couple of months where they just skyrocket in their height and weight. Um, and, and for Daniel, with the muscular dystrophy, he, his muscles can't handle that increase in weight. And, and that's where it's becoming more difficult for him. Um, and, and it's making a difference to, to mum and dad. So, yeah. yeah, that manual handling is something that's really key. And uh, and I think in this case, it sounds like that because he's partially functional, partially mobile, that's made it a harder decision for, for the NDIS and, and this middle ground where he's not required to be in a wheelchair, but he's also finding it really difficult to get in and out of a car seat by himself. The middle ground sounds like it was a very difficult period for the parents. Uh, to work through with the NDIS. And that brings us to our second point, which is persistence. Yeah. Um, what, what We want to highlight the persistence of, of Paul and, and Carol and uh, acknowledge that they know their kids best. Yeah, yeah. Trust, trust yourself as a parent. You know, like even at the end of the day, um, again, not to knock the NDIS, like we said, and a big thing is that, uh, like we mentioned at the very beginning, NDIS has put a huge improvement 
But at the end of the day, it's it's someone who's in a government department um, making a decision on or assisting in making a decision on what's best for your family. And if you don't agree with that, you they don't know your family like you do. Um, they're, they're in an office, you know, reading papers and, and it's not to knock them, but that's just the process. And so you need to fight for your family. You need to you need to stick up for your family and trust yourself. If you're thinking, no, nah, this is not how we do things. We go away this way and we do these things. Um, then fight for it. You don't like that. That's your family. You know that's what you. That's how it is. And and um, and trust yourself. Like nobody knows your family. Nobody knows your kids. Nobody knows yourselves like 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 you do. You know the NDIS person doesn't know that. Another fa- and they might try and compare you to another family, but they're a different family. You know they might say, oh, you know Joe Blob down the road got this with that situation. Yeah, well I don't care. That's that's, that's their family. You know, um, and that's fine. So, so yeah, I really like that. Um, I really love hearing those stories, especially, I guess, as a fellow dad, um, like Paul, just just fighting for his um, for what he believed was true for his family, you know, and that, yeah. that's really beautiful. Yeah, no, fam- family is key in this story, isn't it? And, you know, dragging, dragging a trailer behind the car is vital for this family, for what they do as a family, the getting out and about, the, the sailboat. And if the family's not functioning, doing the things that they love, then the family is going to suffer in general, whether it's mental health or emotional breakdowns or whatever. Um, it, it's going to impact on the family. And, uh, and Daniel's needs, a key part of it. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely. I mean, Daniel doesn't, doesn't, it, Daniel isn't Daniel without his family doing family things. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, it's, he's more, in, it's more important to understand that than his, his actual mobility function. It, it's all part of the big picture and it's important, just as important, I should say, to understand that the family dynamics are just as key to, to his actual physical function. Yeah, and then I think that kind of brings us to the next one, which something that I learned actually lesson number three around the cut floor cars, um, that they, I guess for me, um, they, they can be limited as a family vehicle. I, I to be honest, something new I learned um, because I um, didn't realize, for example, how much of a pain it would be if you had a holiday and you had all that stuff behind the wheelchair and you had to unload all of that stuff. Again, I haven't used these cars. We've been involved in the industry as an engineer. And when you've heard me comment on it, um, it's always around the testing and the engineering. But even from a practical point of view, um, unless you really need to be traveling in that wheelchair all the time, those cut four cars are just a pain, you know, like um, they're not, yeah, it's just you have to unload everything just to go to the toilet. That's a that's a real pain in the you know backside. So. Oh, as a as a family, you got all those suitcases. I know when I go away with my family, I jam it to the roof. Whether it's yeah. sleeping bags, pillows, all of that kind of stuff, it the boot is packed. To be able to take all of that out at the side of the road every time somebody needed a an emergency toilet stop, my god. If I had to do that every time my kids needed an emergency toilet stop or I had a coffee and I needed it and it was coming yeah. through and, and I couldn't, I needed a toilet. Um, those type of times would be really, really difficult as, as a family. Um, uh, just on a side note, people ask us the difference between side entry vans with a, with a lifter at the side and a lowered floor side entry van versus rear entry vans where you come in through the back. This makes a big difference if you need boot space. If you need boot space, having a side entry allows you to keep the boot packed up and you go in and out through the side door just like a passenger would um, in getting out of the passenger doors in the second row. um, Where rear entry, you do need to consider what we've just spoken about is that it does limit your boot space because your boot space is taken up with your entry and exit of the vehicle. So, so please keep that in mind. If, if you're just going locally and it's a few bags of shopping and, and that's the main purpose, then rear entry might be your, your best bet. But if, if it's something that needs the, the rear boot, maybe side entry is, is a, we, again, we'll save that for another podcast. Yeah. It's not to, not to say the rear entry is bad. They are, useful oh, no. but in this case like i said in daniel's case he's mobile he doesn't need to be is uh, traveling in a wheelchair and it's actually a big detriment to his um to him to be traveling in the wheelchair all the time so it was good that they pushed for that and they could recognize that and they could see that yeah not just is a detriment but it's also a detriment to their lifestyle so so yeah i just want to just want to add one more bit to that um as an ot as well i'm gonna i'm gonna advocate for this make sure you get an ot that can actually understand these type of things 
make sure that you you feel confident in your OT that they they get this side of it as well that they're not just that they're buying into the family issues as well uh, and not just bowing over to to what NDIS maybe might be easier to get approved that's that's not going to meet the family needs so make sure you get an OT that understands vehicle modifications that they understand uh, passenger needs as well as driving needs in this case um, but or make sure that you've got a team that's going to get what you need as a family they, they understand it but then that they can also advocate on your behalf and write those reports and and well, basically sell your story to the people that are making the big decisions and and that's vital to get these things through yeah yeah that's right and i guess that's it i think that's time to wrap it up and um i think as we will we'll start winding it up and as we wind up this episode i want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors mobility engineering and williams ot for helping us bring you the interview with uh, paul today daniel's uh, dad um, Williams OT driver assessment and rehab offers all the pieces of the puzzle to assist people with disabilities reach their driving and community mobility goals. And Mobility Engineering is a team of passionate and dedicated people focused on bringing Australia's largest range of suitable transport solutions for all walks of life. And as we say in every episode, the advice provided in this podcast is general in nature. So if you have any queries about what you can do, what will work for you, get in contact with your local OT or mobility dealer and set yourself up with a trial. Trials really do put yourself in the driver's seat, and that's exactly what set the um, Paul. That, that's basically what set them on their journey was doing that trial, that turning seat. So that's yeah. it. We'll All right. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ellie. And again, a shout out to to Paul and and Dan and and Carol. Thanks very much for sharing your stories with us. See you next time. Thanks for listening to the Drive Able Podcast with Brad Williams and Ali Akbarian. If you like what you've heard, make sure you like, rate and subscribe. It really does make a massive difference. If you or anyone you know would like to share a story about driving with a disability or you would like to get in contact, find the show notes or find the resources mentioned in this episode, you can find us on Facebook. Just search at Drive Able Podcast for more information.